Well, good morning, Providence. A lovely morning it is. Conflict is just a normal part of life, unfortunately, and I think it is the, the, um, the just the simple repercussions of free will. And when you got seven billion people on a planet, all with their own free will to make decisions of some sort and have opinions, there will be conflict. And there are undoubtedly people who run from conflict at all costs. And there are some people who dive into conflict uh, just for the sake of doing it. And I think both of those extremes are wrong. And fortunately, God in his wisdom tells us to love one another. Another aspect of God's wisdom is he did not say like one another. He said love one another. And it is the church's uh, constant, constant, not struggle, but joy to figure out what that means. How do we love the lost? How do we love each other in the church? How do we love our families, even at times when we don't like them? You understand that? <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay to not like as long as we love. So with that... Worshiping the God who gave us the command to love one another. Let's stand. Worshiping him, singing hymn number 370. Rejoice the Lord is King. And thank God for it. now in this, this hour of worship, that you'll uh, convict us of our 
wrongdoings, that you will encourage us to do those things uh, that you call us to do. And Lord, speak to us through and by your word, and we pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, again, good morning. We're glad you're here this morning on this uh, warm June Sunday. And we welcome you to worship, and particularly those of you who visit with us. If you are a visitor today, we want you to know that you're not just a visitor, but you're our warmly welcome guest. And we're glad that you're here today and that you're worshiping with us. Some are worshiping, uh, some are down visiting family and others who are worshiping with us, and we're glad that you're here. If this is the first time you've been or the first time in a long time, if you would just look there in the pew pocket in front of you and complete a a visitor's card that will help us uh, remember your visit and respond to it and drop that in the offering plate as it goes by. And again, uh, we are glad that you're here today. And to our internet friends who will visit us this week by internet, we just appreciate you and thank you for being with us as well. And our prayers are with you as well. And we welcome you today. And again, uh, if you have not had an opportunity to uh, greet and meet everybody this morning during our fellowship time this is a good opportunity to do that and we would encourage you to do that as brother sean comes to lead us in our fellowship hymn let us stand and sing there is no name so sweet on earth Peace. Let's sing together, rejoice in the 
Christ, who gave himself for us, that we might have life and have it more abundantly here and have it eternally in your presence. We thank you for that joy. It is joy in Christian companionship, knowing and loving each other as your children and as your church. Lord, you just seek to have us live in the midst of that joy, even in the difficult times of our lives, in all seasons, all times, and in all ways. Lord, we just thank you for that. We thank you for this day of worship and the opportunity to do that. We thank you, Lord, to pray and to seek for you for healing for those who, uh, for whom we know to pray and others for whom we do not. Lord, there's so many issues that we bring to you in prayer today, so many needs that we know of, and we bring those and submit them and lay them before you, O God, and pray your healing power upon them. Lord, for some who still grieve the loss of loved ones and who seek every day to put the pieces of those uh, that uh, of life back together and deal with that grief. Lord, we just pray for comfort and your grace. Lord, we pray for this church and the work that we seek to do here. We ask you, Lord God, that we would be found in the center in accord, in accord with your will and your purpose and your plan. Lord, we pray for those young men and women who are in the military who uh, serve this country by protecting us and keeping the peace and uh, going in, in uh, far-flung places to uh, to do battle. Lord, those who are away from us who are deployed today, maybe even in harm's way as we speak, Lord, we pray for them. We continue to pray for our missionaries, for those, oh Lord, who carry the gospel message across this globe. We seek to have you, O oh God, minister in their lives. Lord, we pray today for uh, for our children and our children's homes and, uh, and the work that we do for them. Lord, we continue to lift them up to you. Lord, we pray for our families, our young families and families with children, Lord. We just pray for them that your anointed power would be upon them and that you would help us as we seek to uh, share the responsibility of, uh, of raising that child in this world today. Lord, as we love them and care for them, we pray your anointed blessing upon them. Lord, we pray for so many of the needs of this community, but most of all, we pray for the lost, Lord, that those who may not know you in full pardon and forgiveness of sin, who never come to that point where we may have said uh, yes to you, Lord, come into my heart. I believe on you. Live with me. Let me live for you. Lord, when they've never come to that point, Lord, we pray for that. We pray that you would anoint them and, uh, with your spirit and speak to us as we seek to uh, to offer that plan and, and work of salvation uh, that uh, they so badly need. Lord, again, we pray for this service and our time that's here together for each one that's come today. Lord, we just thank you for them and we pray that you would meet that need that's in that life today as only you can do in accordance with your will. Lord, we give all of this and thank you in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. As our praise team comes down, just a few things that uh, maybe need to come to our announcement, uh, our attention. Announcements that need to come to our attention. Um, okay, I believe this week, this week is the no handbell night. It's back in no choir. No handbell, no choir. So please be aware of that on, on uh, Wednesday evening. And uh, also, I, I believe, uh, I don't see Miss Barbara here this morning, but I was thinking that they were going to meet at the front today. Oh, there she is. I've been looking at Miss Lorraine and Aaron all morning and missed you completely. There you are. Um, Miss, Miss B is here this morning, so she has left her and she's going to meet with the uh, uh, the FWA uh, girls at the immediate after service, so if you would meet right at the front, uh, I think um, the choir knows their job. I wanted to meet just a few moments. So, um, and as well, the BBS announcements for the week, uh, and the uh, other children's announcements, and then next Sunday night, I want to be sure that you know that uh, Fletcher Stubbs uh, and uh, his wife Leah are going to be here. Uh, in concert, and they're just uh, promises to be a whole lot of things good going on that night, and uh, 
Fletcher and Leah have been friends for a long time. They have been active in Richland First Baptist Church. And uh, Leah is still the organist there. And um, just a wonderful people. So we encourage you to be here next Sunday evening uh, to share with them. Um, also, there the, we have the, the assistance, the needs assistance sheets uh, available to you. If you know someone in the area who has needs or needs assistance, we have uh, um, the uh, organizations that perhaps can help them uh, and the phone numbers for those, and you can get those at the, uh, at the church office as well. Any other announcements that need to come to our attention? I just wanted to add, yes, ladies, um, the announcements, Gary, the word assignment, Yes. In other words, you're not going to sign them 16 algebra problems at the end of the book. Yes. Okay, good. Brother Sean, I think we're ready. Let's continue our worship with our offertory hymn, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart, number 503.
All righty. Joy in the morning over there. Uh, we're delighted that um, uh, Cameron and Marquita are with us today. I appreciate that uh, music during the offertory. And that was a, uh, a surprise. I didn't know that was going to happen, but that was a pleasant surprise. So we're glad that you appreciate that so much and uh, always appreciate you being here with us. Philippians, we're still having joy in the morning. It's Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Today we're going to fuss and fight and have joy right in the middle of it. Some of you look at me like, oh, how's that going to happen? <laughs> well, we're going to see. Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I plead with Euodia, and I plead with Sintish to agree um, with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask your loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side and in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Will you pray with me? Lord, we just thank you for this scripture. We thank you for the old apostle who, so inspired by your spirit, wrote these words so long ago. We thank you for the message that they give us. Lord, speak to our hearts afresh and new in these moments. We pray through and by the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Doyle Young, who a number of years ago wrote a book called New Life for Your Church, tells this story in his book. He says that in the late 1800s, there were just two deacons, two deacons. Now, we can kind of sympathize with that because uh, we don't have the full seven at, at this moment, but we have what we have. But this little Baptist church had two deacons, a little church in Mayfield County, Kentucky. And one Sunday, one of the deacons, feeling uh, ever so needful to do something for the pastor, came in and put a small wooden peg on the back wall by the door so that the minister could hang his hat up when he came in. Well, when the other deacon discovered that the peg had been hung, he was outraged because he had not been consulted about this project. And before long, a fight broke out between the two deacons. The church got involved in it. There was a split in the church, and one group went one way and one group went the other. Doyle Young says, to this day, the story goes that you can find in Mayfield County, Kentucky, the pro-peg Baptists and the anti-peg Baptists. <laughs> the question looms this morning, have you ever been a part of, or at least a bystander, in a conflict within the church family? Don't answer that. Well, a better question probably is, have you ever, uh, when was the last time that you saw or were part of a conflict in the church family? Don't answer that one either. <laughs> conflict happens, and you know how painful it can be when that happens in the church. But churches do have conflict. It gets away from them sometimes. It splits churches. Friends divide and, and separate out from each other. Many of those friends never speak to each other again. Competing sides charge each other with being unchristian-like and bad conduct. And there are reasons that, uh, that churches go through all of this kind of turmoil. But it's never a good situation when it's left unchecked, when something isn't dealt with, and when it goes a long time without something having been done. But sometimes the issues are important and involve spiritual soundness in the church. And sometimes it's necessary to have a certain amount of, con of uh, conflict in the church. But not conflict that's dealt with improperly. Not conflict that's left unchecked in the church. And most of the time, con uh, 
conflict, turmoil is over petty, insignificant issues. Sometimes we get into conflicts about uh, heavy theological issues that we should come to agree upon. But most often it's about issues that should simply resolve themselves or shouldn't have come up at all. And many churches have split over issues such as choosing the right hymn book for the congregation or choosing the right color of carpet for the congregation or choosing the right picture to go behind the baptistry in the congregation. And church conflicts bring about scars and wounds in the body of Christ. And in the process, our reputation goes right down the tubes. It becomes stained in the community. And this is important to know this because Jesus himself and John writes in chapter 13, um, verse 35, Jesus taught his disciples there that they ought to be known by their love for each other. Jesus says, by this, every, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Well, in the great Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about there in chapter 5 uh, as he teaches that sermon on the hillside at Galilee. And he told his listeners there that if you go to the altar, if you bring your offering to the altar and you remember that you have something against somebody, that you ought to lay your offering down at the altar and go to that person uh, against whom you've got something and get it straight or who may have something against you, and get that straightened out and then be reconciled to your brother and then come back and offer your offering because Jesus knew that we do not have the capacity to truly worship him, truly worship God when we are at odds with our brothers and sisters. Even in his high priestly prayer when Jesus knelt in the garden at Gethsemane, when he bowed on his knees and he faced his heavenly father, and he prayed that beautiful prayer for you and me. Father, not only those that I have now, but those who will yet come to me. That includes you and me if you're a child of God today. And Jesus prayed there earnestly on the night before he died. This was a matter of consideration in his heart. That they might be one. So it would appear from the scriptures that God wants his children to get along. From the story that's before us today in the scripture, Paul gives us some principles on how we might do that, how we might maintain our joy in the midst of conflict. That you and I might have our disagreements, that we bring them in check, we pray together over them, we live with them together in the presence of the Holy Spirit and while we do that, we come to a common ground of grace for each other and in the midst of that, have joy. The first thing I think that we need to know from this scripture this morning is that conflict comes to good churches just like they come to unhealthy churches. Even in good churches, you'll find brothers and sisters who have differences with each other. And such was the case, no less, at the church here at Philippi. Paul begins by telling the church here at Philippi that, uh, that they are his joy and his crown. You are, are something to me, church at Philippi. He literally views these Christians as, uh, as a reward. Uh, they are trophies of grace. Uh, as Paul would consider them. Not because Paul was proud of himself for what he had done, but these were tangible signs of Paul's efforts that he strove uh, for so uh, diligently on this earth while he was here. Things that he could lay before the Father's feet one day. And these folks at Philippi were tangible symbols of Paul's spiritual work here on this earth. Paul loved that church at Philippi. He was proud of those people, not uh, in a sinful kind of way, but he was proud of their work. He was pleased with how good they had done and what a great church they had become and how loving they were to each other. But even in the best of times, all of a sudden, there's a problem. 
We've been preaching along about joy and things have been going well and all of a sudden we kind of hit a wall this morning. There are thorns in Paul's crown and that thorn is a disagreement between the brothers and the sisters there at Philippi. Even as saved members of the body of Christ, personalities uh, are still going to clash. We're still going to get our feelings hurt and there are times when we're still going to be overwhelmed with our lives and all the things that come to us that aren't easy. People still disappoint us in this life and we have different approaches. There are things that I would come at differently than you do. There are things this morning, believe it or not, that I believe that you don't probably believe. There are things that you believe that I don't probably believe. We are not going to agree as long as we live in this world on every issue of theology. We disagree on some things. But the real problem comes when we get a loss of perspective. When we lose the perspective of who we are and what we're here for and what our job is and whose children we are. A story is told that one day a father took his son and one of his son's friends and they went on a fishing trip. And they got to the campsite and it seemed like everything was perfect. It was just going to be a perfect camping trip. The weather was warm, but it wasn't too hot. The lake was calm and they had a great campsite right on the edge of the lake. They raised their tent, they cooked their supper, they built a campfire and they cooked their supper and they went to bed that night anticipating a great day of fishing the next day. When they woke up the next morning and unzipped the tent and stuck their heads out, a cold front had moved in through the night and it was in the low 40s and there was a stiff, hard, cold wind blowing outside. One of those that, as my mother used to say, would cut right through you. Well, they decided to stay in their tent most of the day that day and occupy themselves with telling stories and playing little games and things and, and just making the best of the situation with one another. Well, they got through that day and they went to bed that night anticipating that the next day was going to get better. And so they got up the next morning thinking maybe this will be a better day. They unzipped the tent and stuck their head out. Not only was that same cold, stiff, hard wind blowing, but now it was raining. It had just begun to rain over the nighttime. And once again, they spent the day rainy and cold and windy, trying to wait this out, thinking that maybe the next day would be better. But by the end of the day, everyone was on edge and angry at one another. So finally, the next morning, no change in the weather they decided to pack up and go home. I think the moral of that story could be this. They discovered that when fishermen don't fish, they fight. Because you see, they'd gotten agitated with each other. They began to fight among themselves in the, in the tent and, and finally realized they weren't getting along very well, so they better go home. When fishermen don't fish, they fight. When you and I are not busy being the fishers of men that God has called us to be, when we're not busy doing and concentrating fully on being the disciples that God has created the church to be, we are apt at that moment to begin to get into disagreements and arguments in the church. But in verse 2 of our text this morning, Paul recognizes that that's happened in the church at Philippi. And he says, I plead. Parakaleo is the Greek word there, and basically it literally means to get down on your knees and urge and beg. You know, Paul was a passionate man, and when Paul was pleading and begging you, my guess is it was hard to resist going ahead and doing what Paul wanted you to do. But note that term is repeated and applied equally to both of those parties that are having a disagreement with each other. Paul pleads with them tenderly and equally. He says, I plead with Euodia, and I plead with Sintish. He says, I plead with the first one, and then I plead with the second one. I plead with both of you women equally. Apparently, uh, uh, a disagreement had broke out 
a, a fight had, had occurred between two women in the church. And that first name, I have done my best to get it right. And I, I, they probably were fighting over her name. That's about all I can say. But it was, I think it's Euodia. Euodia would be the Greek to that, Euodia. And he talks, he says, uh, there's a problem. These two women have, have started this disagreement in the church. And Paul calls them by name. And he pleads with them over their differences. But you know, our collective efforts as a body of Christ become more important. What we can do together as the church of Jesus Christ is more important than what's important to me. What's important to me ought to be what the, what the Holy Spirit is trying to do with this entire body of discipled believers. Not only does God conflict, uh, does conflict occur even in good churches, not only does it uh, 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 occur among good people, but Paul says it, uh, this conflict has consequences. Secondly, there are things that happen in the church that destroy and, and disturb the order of what the Holy Spirit is trying to do. These are two women who both are committed Christians. They're good women. They've worked side by side with Paul. I get the picture from this, uh, this verse where Paul says, I plead with uh, a Judea and I plead with Sintesh to agree with each other in the Lord. And I ask you, loyal yoke fella, fella, help these women. Women, Paul says, who have contended, contended. He doesn't just say they've worked at my side. They've uh, done a few things at my side. But he says they've contended. That's a strong word for being involved, for being faithful, for being committed, for being passionate for the cause of Christ. They have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. These women have been hardworking women through the years. Paul knew these women. He knew their integrity as Christian women. He knew what kind of women they were and how committed they had been to the cause of Christ. And yet now they've had a disagreement. Now we don't know what they disagreed about. And I don't think it's any accident that Paul doesn't tell us what they disagreed about. Because if he had, it would have been like his thorn in the side. We don't know what that thorn in the side was. But we all know what a thorn in the side is. We all have them of one sort or the other. We don't know what this agreement was, disagreement was about. If we did, we could say, well, I don't have that disagreement. That doesn't apply to me. Paul left that part out because a disagreement is a disagreement. And he says it does apply. Paul doesn't say who he thinks is right or who he thinks is wrong in this disagreement. But rather he pleads for them to be of the same mind. To agree with each other, he says in verse 2, to agree with each other in the Lord. It will seem that Paul is saying for the, for the Lord's sake, for Christ's sake, for the church's sake... Girls, you need to get along with each other. And church, you need to help them to get along with each other. They ought to end this disagreement. It's going to have consequences. And there are things that happen when disagreements go on unchecked and undealt with in the church. When Christians fight and they continue to fight, several things happen. These women had a problem that's alienating them from the uh, from the others in the church and, and the potential to harm the whole fellowship. Because I don't have to stand here this morning, those of you who have experience and many of you who have long time experience as being church members, is that when a conflict arises in the church and it's left unchecked, then all of a sudden I become a part of the pro-peg group and you become part of the anti-peg group. And first thing you know, there's an us and a them in the church. And they can't agree on anything. They can't this. They don't that. They never this. They aren't that. And then they look over at us and they this and they that and them that and those that. And first thing you know, it's throwing back and forth one against the other. Well, that's what happens when these are left unchecked. And Paul knew that. There are two sides to every story. And Paul said, you need to get to the bottom of these sides. When things ha when uh, a fight happens in the church and it's left unchecked, it, it harms the whole entire church eventually. 
It's the whole church's ministry that will go down the tubes. And it takes years. It takes years for a church to recover sometimes from this kind of problem. Secondly, it disrupts the unity of the church. Folks, in this day and age when the church, not this church so much, but when the church of Jesus Christ is under attack on every side, when the church of Jesus Christ is, when people come against the church, when we faced Islam right here in our own community, when we face other uh, contemporary religions right here in our own community that, that come against Christianity today, we can't afford to fight among ourselves. We don't have the, the, the time or the energy to fight among ourselves. We need to be defending the cross of Jesus Christ. And third, fighting is a bad testimony to a lost world. I can't stand here this morning and tell you that we're not going to have our conflicts within the church. But it's our job, just like it, uh, Paul pled with the church at Philippi, it's our job to get with it and to get busy and resolve that conflict and to come to a win-win situation, to love each other in Christian brotherly and sisterly love and move on with that before it gets outside of the doors because when it gets outside of the doors, it's out there now. It's like my father used to say, it's like feathers out of the pillow in the wind and you'll never get them all back in. And the media has a heyday with it. The media loves it when the church fights among itself. The world has a field day. Paul maintains that Christians ought to be able to resolve their conflicts without having to parade their dirty laundry out in public before an unbelieving world. And the third and final thing that I think Paul is telling us here is that sometimes you need help resolving a conflict. The scripture is full of that where you don't try to do this on your own oftentimes. There's of course the underlying assumption that both of these women want to work things out, that they love each other, that they've probably been a part of the women's organization together, that they have been um, uh, faithful stewards in the church together. But Paul says to the folks at Philippi, he says, folks, help these women. Come together with these women and try to help them resolve this conflict or it's going to tear your church apart at Philippi. Paul called on an individual here. He calls on, in verse 3, you'll see there, he calls him loyal yoke fellow. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side. Now, we don't know exactly if he's calling on an individual there. That word, um, loyal yoke fellow, in the original Greek was sisgus. <laughs> I'll get that word in a minute. In the original Greek was Sisgus, and it was a capitalized word. So it may very well have been a person's name. But you know, in those days, they named people for their, their responsibilities and the work that they did and their personalities. A name meant something to an individual in those days. So Sisgus, capitalized in the ancient Greek, meant loyal yoke fellow. That is one who would come between these two women or come to these two women and basically mediate this conflict and try to heal this conflict between these two women. And Paul is calling upon this person to be the mediator for this conflict and help restore the unity there at Philippi. He's reminded not to lose sight of who these women are. Paul says to this yoke fellow and to those others, he says, these have been great women in the church. I named them right along with uh, Clement and some of the others. Uh, he says in verse 3, he goes on to say, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. These are not lost people. These are God's people in Christ Jesus there at Philippi. Well, the clearest example, I think, of a third party mediation, and you say, well, how, how do we mediate? Well, you know, Jesus left us a, a wonderful example of that in Matthew chapter 18. Jesus says these words. He says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you, just between the two of you. You know what that means? That means that you don't talk to everybody in the neighborhood about it and then go to them. It doesn't mean that you go to them and then go talk to everybody in the neighborhood about it. 
doesn't mean either one of those. It says very clearly, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. How in the world can you trust somebody that won't keep it just between the two of you? And you know they're not going to do that. You can't trust them. And you can't trust people who will try to get it out of them either. Because there are people who will maliciously say, well, what did she say? How, how did she say it? What, what are they going to do? None of your business. It's between the two of us. Jesus said that. Go and point out their fault just between the two of you. So if you know of a situation like that, don't ask and don't pry and don't pick. Let them alone until they get it resolved. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along. And these are others who are trusted people just like you were trusted. So that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now the truth is that most of us don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. This reminds me a lot of those situations where you see on TV, you see the uh, cop program and you see uh, uh, somebody um, uh, calling uh, the cops because of a domestic dispute and they go over to that house, the cops go over to that house and they try to resolve that domestic dispute and all of a sudden the two who are, who, the one who called and the other one who was called upon, they, they side up and, and turn on the cop. You've seen that. You've heard of it. I know if you haven't seen it, you've heard of it, where cops got hurt. One of the uh, most dangerous situations they say that policemen get involved in are domestic disputes, and that's because they go trying to break up the domestic dispute, and those who, who are in the domestic dispute turn on the policeman. Well, that's kind of how I feel with this. If, I, if, you're, uh, if, if you and one other person are having a dispute, and I come to you, I'm scared you're going to turn on me. You're going to turn around and say, it is absolutely none of your business. Well, you know what? It really isn't my business until it affects the house of God, until it affects the church, and until it affects the witness and the testimony of who we are together as the body of Christ, and then it does become my business. Jesus said it was my business. He said, go. Don't tell anybody else. Go. Just you go. And help get this straightened out between these two people. That's what we're afraid is going to happen is that they're going to turn on us. But there's a goal here. The goal is restoration. The goal is reconciliation. The goal is, is that we come back together in Christian love. The goal is grace, that we forgive each other, that we come together on common ground, that we have a win-win situation, that we learn that not everything has to be my way and not everything has to be your way. But you know what? What we need to do is find out what the Holy Spirit's way is, and then he's going to direct us. And sometimes we forget what that way is. And we need to do it in Christ Jesus because being in Christ Jesus, uh, Jesus has taught us already how to negotiate. He's taught us already how to practice conflict resolution. And he certainly is the prince of peacemaking. You can be sure of that. The church sometimes has conflicts, but differences are going to occur in God's family. But conflict in the church, left unchecked and undealt with, is always going to destroy our testimony in the community and the world at large. And it's going to disrupt the unity of the church. And when the unity of the church is disrupted and you get so far as to have an us and them situation and the church splits, it takes years for the church to ever recover from, some, from that kind of a mess. And it's a bad example to a lost world. And sometimes those involved in a conflict may need a third party mediator. One of us, one of you. I may be in a conflict with somebody and you have to come in and help me resolve that conflict. And we need to be willing, willing to be peacemakers in the church. Peacemakers are people who quietly move about the congregation. You really don't even know they exist. Why? Because they don't blab all over the place what's going on. They do what they need to do for the cause of Christ, and it remains inside their heart and never goes anywhere else. We need to be a church at peace with itself, a church who loves each other,
a church committed to having a testimony in the community that's irrefutable, a church that the world can turn to for an example of peace and harmony. Why? Because our Lord and Savior, the one who designed and created the church and established it as his bride, has told us to. This morning, if you're not, a, uh, if you're not saved, if you're not a, a Christian, you may be asking the question, well, if the church can't get along any better, then I see it get along. I don't know why I need to be a part of it. I'll tell you why you need to be a part of it. For the same reason that I need to be a part of it, because I am a sinner who is saved by grace. When I accepted the Lord as my Savior, He didn't suddenly wave a wand and make me perfect. But He did call me a light to a life of perfection. That means my job is to move in that direction as quickly as I can and to live Christ in this world. But I am still a sinner saved by grace. And I would rather be a sinner saved by grace than a sinner lost on my way to hell any day of the week. So I urge you to come this morning. If you've never accepted him, maybe you have a, a situation where you need to fix something with another church member. Maybe you're a child of God and you need to come and recommit your life. As our musicians come uh, and lead us in our invitation hymn, or maybe God is calling you to be a part of this fellowship and you need to come and make yourself a part of this fellowship and join this church and get busy in this community. Whatever that need is this morning, I encourage you to come. Brother Sean. Excellent words. Thank you. Let us stand together, church, and sing. They'll know that we are Christians by our love.
in love for one another and for those who are outside our church and the community, that they too might know your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. We thank you for our pastor. We ask, Father, that you would continue to guide him and direct him and lead him as we have called him to be the shepherd of this community. We thank you for other staff members and for all of those who volunteer and serve you and your kingdom through this church. We ask now, Father, that as we go from this place, we would go in the love that we have for you and that you have for us, that others might indeed know that we are Christians by our love and want that love for themselves through Jesus Christ. We give you thanks and praise in his name. Amen. Ladies.